everything all beautiful. right let's restart welcome Take two. Uh, my name is Lily Compton, and as you can see, it's a big feat to get logistics <laughs> together. Um, we'll get started. And so today, what we're going to do is a little bit of housekeeping before I pass on to my panel. Um, first of all, we'll keep the questions to the end. We have sent out a survey to most of you to read a little bit of the content that we prepared and incorporated some of the questions that we got beforehand. However, not all of the questions might be addressed in our presentation. So feel free to uh, bring that up again at the end of the presentation. We'll take the questions from you in the audience here. I think the, the way to do it is to come up and then speak into the mic so that everyone in the room and online can hear the questions. Those of you who are online, feel free to um, write your questions in the chat box. And I believe Terry and John will help to uh, address those questions as they come up. So um, to move on, let's move to the. Uh, Wait just a minute first. Let me let me speak for just a minute because I'm supposed to give it a welcoming. Okay. For everyone. Okay. Okay. And then there you unmute. Yeah, I'm going to unmute. Perfect. You're muted. Okay. Now I'm unmuted. Good. Hi, folks. Hope everybody is enjoying uh, the good food so far. We've had more than enough of it today, I think. Uh, on behalf of the University of Tennessee Health Science Center and the College of Graduate Health Sciences, welcome to the 12th annual USETDA Association uh, Conference. <clears throat> After all we had to eat today, I just want everybody to keep their eyes open and maybe they'll hear a little bit about what we say, but we, hopefully. Um, whether by virtual means or in person, we are glad to gather again uh, in Cleveland for this first hybrid USETDA uh, US uh, meeting since the pandemic. One good thing from the pandemic is that all of us have become more online accomplished. It has helped create groups such as the USCTDA formatting and engagement group. And one thing I want you to realize is that um, both of this year's plenary session actually evolved from those two groups. Those two groups are very important for our association. Now, they're relatively new. Uh, they're about two years, well, not even two years old yet, I don't think, but they're, we're in our second year. Uh, in the first year, we had the uh, formatting group only, and now we have an engagement group, a community engagement group. And both of those groups are important. If you're not familiar with those, uh, please become familiar with those groups uh, because they're very active and uh, actually very important for us. <coughs> Now, one of these groups, and I'm gonna talk about this a little bit later, one of these groups has actually started to focus on creating an ETD book, okay? And I'm gonna tell you about that a little bit later, and I think it's gonna be a very important book for everyone. <clears throat> now, one way that you can get the information about the book is if you look at the preface to the information that we submitted, uh, the pre-conference information that we submitted, it, describes what's taking place relative to the ETD uh, formatting and review book. <clears throat> As our ETD programs uh, have developed on all of our campuses over so many years, um, how much of our information is really unique relative to what we do on our campuses? I suspect that all of it is pretty well kind of shared with universities as well as, as relative to what we actually do in the ETD processes that we have. Uh, but there are a lot of nuances to all of this. And when you get into the nitty gritty details, you start seeing those, those nuances show up. <coughs> and what happens is we kind of share now, but we share, you know, kind of helter skelter. Uh, we'll go to this university or that university and we see what that university is doing and we say, oh, I would like to use their template. They've got the template up there. 
Well, we download the template and we have to redo the template because it doesn't fit what we're doing. We have an issue with standardization as a group. And we need to think about that real seriously because uh, I think there's a lot of areas on all of our campuses where we could be doing things more together and actually eliminate a lot of work for everybody. If we can standardize something that we do on one of our campuses and say, yeah, that's really the way. And as a group we can get together and do this now and say, yeah, that's, that's the way all of us should be doing this because that's, that works and it fits with my campus and fits with everybody's campus. So I think we need to start really thinking about, we don't have to standardize everything, of course, we'll keep our own title pages. But I, when you really think about it, that's probably the only thing that we really need to, to have that's different uh, in most cases. We could really share a lot of what we do and but keep the title pages, of course, for our own universities and the way we design them and so forth. And that's, that's easy enough to change that uh, anywhere. <clears throat> the other thing is that over the past 20 some odd years now, since basically 1998 is when we had the first uh, NTLD, uh, NTLTD international conference in, in Memphis, Tennessee, which myself and, uh, and Gail McLean from uh, <coughs> Virginia Tech and Ed Fox and John Eaton, who's long retired now, uh, we got together and we put that first program together, that first symposium together that was held in Memphis so many years ago. But the whole focus at that time was get the word out about ETDs and let's kind of get more and more universities and colleges involved in the ETD process. We've done that. We've been there. We've done that. And kind of reaching the end of the era relative to bringing new universities in because especially in this country, because most universities, they're really involved with ETDs. They're all for it. At least that's what my assessment is at the present time. And so I think we need to kind of refocus ourselves a little bit. It's time for us to kind of branch out and say, hey, we know how to digitally post electronic thesis and dissertations now. What are we going to do that now that we're able to do it? Okay. How are we going to use that fact that we now have ETDs? How are we going to use that to add more value to our students and add value to our faculty? and to our universities, okay? And I think there's a lot of ways that we can do it. And one way is to focus more on the reader than on the process of us generating the ETD. In other words, we generate ETDs, but we need to realize the end point of everything we produce is a reader. So the easier it is for that reader to use the material that we provide, the better off our students are, and the better off the university is, especially if when they look at an ETD, it looks like a book, okay? And this is one of my kind of points, my high points, is that really we should, we should look like a book. We shouldn't look like a book report at all. We should look like a book. And how many books do you open up that are double-spaced? If you're not working with kids' books, it's probably not very many, folks. Very few. How many journals do you open up that are double spaced? I haven't seen one in a long time. It doesn't happen. So keep, keep that in mind. Okay. Now I know that it's difficult to change a lot of campuses. It's very difficult. Uh, but you need to, we're kind of the emissaries for ETDs on their campus. So we need to kind of keep that in mind and try to recruit assistance where you need to in order to improve the vision of your university. Universities, first of all, have to realize that their ETDs are out there in the public for everyone to see, okay? So they need to look as good as possible. And we need to keep that in mind. And that's just one item. I think there's several items that I can talk, but I don't have time to talk about them right now. Before I do that, I wanna do something that's kind of unusual. And I want to thank John Hagen for everything he has done 
with our ETD program and our USETD association. This is a difficult task to set up something like this, especially what he's done with this hybrid presentation this year is really, really something different than doing a pure online or a pure in-person presentation. As you can, you can tell by the fact that uh, we do have glitches in our system and we have to stop and try to readjust things and uh, that's okay, but nevertheless, here's John right here. John, I just thank you for everything you've done, okay? Um, this usually comes at the end of, a, of an association meeting like this, but I want everybody to thank John every day he, they see him because this is a difficult task. I really know what it's about, okay? Um, so we extend all thanks to John. I want to extend, again, extend, extend thank you to our board of directors for this program, for all their hard work. I know what they're doing here as well, and they're working really hard to, to try to provide us a good association meeting. Now, in addition to that, I want to thank our College of Graduate Health Sciences Dean, uh, Dr. Don Thomason. If it wasn't for Don picking up on my sending him an email about sponsorship, um, we wouldn't have the sponsorship we have today. And I, I asked him, I, can we, maybe we can sponsor him a little bit? No, he went all out. Uh, we became a premium sponsor. And so I think that's great. You need to take that message back to your universities as well. In other words, we need to sustain this. I think we need to, as I said, we need to improve the product and kind of refocus ourselves a little bit, improve our membership, hopefully, and bring in more universities into this program. And that's one way I think we can do it, is to kind of, kind of branch out in a way in terms of improving uh, what we do with ETDs. <coughs> so with that, uh, I want to kind of move over and let Lily take this now, and uh, I guess all I need to do is mute my box. Thank you, Larry. Now, um, there was going to be an order of how I did things, but because it's complicated with the turning on and off the mics, I'm going to switch things around a little bit. So I'm going to go quickly to introduce um, the panelists, but then when I go to the first question, they will get a chance to introduce themselves again, all right? So I'm not going to switch the mics on and off twice. Um, so let me start with the first person right here on the screen. We took these shots while we were on one of our weekly meetings. So candid, right? Uh, this is Lee. She joins us from Overleaf, and she will talk a little bit about um, how we use Overleaf in the process. Sally. Um, Sally joins us from uh, George Mason University. Uh, myself, I am from Iowa State. Stacy next to me, she's from University of Florida. Um, Erica is from the University of Utah. And Larry, uh, is from the University of Tennessee Health Science Center. So we will jump straight to question one. Let me pull up my questions. So we looked at, um, as we were drafting the content, we, we kind of came up with an outline. But after that, the questions that came through, the first draft of questions that came through from you, it, there was a theme. So I'm trying to organize the questions um, that makes sense uh, in, in a thematic way. So the first question relates to organizational structures, right? So let's look at that. I've seen how different our institutions are regarding the ETDA staff. And by ETDA, I'm referring to electronic thesis and dissertation administration. That's what we all do. Um, sometimes we are housed in the grad college, sometimes we're in the library, sometimes we're somewhere else. We are all over. And sometimes we are a one person show. Sometimes we work in a team. For this, I'll move from the biggest to smallest in terms of the number of files processed per year. And so with that, I'm going to hand over to Stacy. 
And you can look at her slide on the screen as she talks through her, st her structure. Hi. Yes. yes. I'm at the University of Florida. As Lily mentioned, um, we're kind of the, the big folk on the panelists. Um, we do about 1,200 uh, dissertations and theses each year. Um, we have uh, our largest semester is actually the summer semester. So we submit um, fall, spring, and summer, but summer is our largest cohort. I had about 462 dissertation, doctoral dissertations go through this summer. Um, so summer is, is quite the kicker for us. Um, you can see we kind of have uh, Lily put together how we work. Um, in my office, I am the associate director, but I'm in the graduate school. So although thesis and dissertation is a portion of my job, I also handle like graduate council, the graduate curriculum committee. Um, we publish the graduate catalog, the commencement program. So any of the graduate publications also come through my office. But specifically related to theses and dissertations, I do have two full-time editors on staff. Um, collectively, we have over 50 years of um, service with the graduate school. So I'm very blessed to have very seasoned folks that have been around and partnered with me a long time. Um, you may notice that we also point out that we have um, a partnership with the UF Computing Help Desk. Those are folks that are strictly IT. So um, I have two assistants that work um, for the help desk who are responsible for any updates to the template that we may provide to them. Um, they also will help students through the technical issues of how to use the template and they um, will help format the document in our template, but they are not editors. They do not review the document. So there is sometimes a little bit of confusion on our campus when the students don't realize they still need to submit to the graduate school and have it approved through my, my editors. So that is something that is a little bit different than a lot of other institutions. Um, we also obviously work very closely with the university libraries and ProQuest. Um, we do use their administrator to submit our publishing agreements, but we don't use them for the review process. We have an internal system that was built actually a few years before the ProQuest. So it's not that we, we wouldn't have used theirs. We just had built in-house, and so we still maintain that. Um, I think that's a, a little bit about us. I'll, I'll allow Lily to go. All right. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Erica Finley. I am the uh, one of the uh, manuscript editors at the University of Utah in the graduate school. Um, I am not the actual head honcho for our thesis office, um, but I am one of the people that does the on the ground editing. Erica, we can't hear you over here. One second. Oh. I'm unmuted and I see, I see that I'm talking. No one hears me. You can hear me online, just not the in-person people. I, okay. I can hear you, Erica. <laughs> can anyone hear me? I, well, I can hear you, Sally. <laughs> okay, thank you, Erica. <laughs> thank you, Erica. <laughs> Further tweaking, perhaps. Let's try it. All right, Erica, can you say something? Yes. Can you hear me? I hear her. I can still hear you. <laughs> Just not the people in person, right?
I can't hear what John is saying. Um, I have not been able to hear anything from Terry's mic. So I don't know if he's telling me to talk. I cannot hear. <laughs> I can see that Lily's talking, but I, I can't hear her at all. Oh, all right. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear yes. you. Yes. All right. And can you all hear them from my laptop? Can you hear me? Close enough. All right. Close enough. We're going to do this. Do I need to talk louder? Does that help? Um, we're still hearing echoes from maybe oh, that mic. Echoes. No, sorry. The echo is in this room. No, I think it's going to echo Yeah, little did y'all know this is an exercise in how to host a <laughs> vibrant conference. <laughs> yes, we're actually not even discussing ETDs at all. We're just, <laughs> we're just this is a beta <laughs> test for hybrid conference. <laughs> we're not even going to talk about ETDs. Here, everyone can look at a picture of a cat or an actual cat, not a picture. There you go. This is little Sam. I love your kitty. All right. I think we're good. Um, okay. We're getting good reception in the room. All right, Erica, back to you. Okay. All right. So I am a manuscript editor at the University of Utah. We do about 800 to 1,000 ETDs a year. Um, like Stacy, I would say that our summer is probably our busiest. Fall is definitely not. <laughs> Fall is, is our time where we can kind of all just breathe for a moment because summer was so awful. Um, I am not the main person in my office. I am, I am just an editor. I do have a boss above me um, who is the thesis office manager. And then below him, we have three full-time manuscript editors. And we did have one assistant manuscript editor who was part-time. We just lost her and I'm not sure that we're going to replace her. So it looks like it might just be a four person office from this point on. Um, so the way we are structured, we are in the graduate school. We have um, the thesis office manager basically checks our submissions in Pro ProQuest, although we don't do the majority of our editing through ProQuest. We do that through our on-base system. Um, so it's mostly the manuscript editors going back and forth with students. Um, we do all of our training. We maintain our templates. We teach people how to use our templates. We do outreach to departments to try to teach them um, about what we require in the thesis office. Um, and the thesis office manager is trying to deal with... Um, a significant backlog. I've only been at the University of Utah for about a year. Um, shortly before everything uh, hit the fan with the pandemic, apparently they were doing everything on paper. So they've got a huge backlog that the thesis office manager is trying to deal with all the paperwork from past semesters. So we are behind on publishing. So he has been spending most of his time trying to get the publishing back on track. Um, I suppose when he's done with that, it'll be the four of us mostly doing the same thing, managing um, any submissions that come in. We do have um, LaTeX is our biggest weakness. I guess that'll be something we talk about in the future. Uh, we do have a LaTeX and a Word template, and uh, we are struggling to offer support for our LaTeX template <laughs> as much as we can. But um, yeah, we are a very heavy science oriented school. So we have a lot of reprinted material coming through if that's something that's of interest to people. Um, I guess I'll move on to the next person and <laughs> shut All up. Right. 
<laughs> Thank you. Um, I hope everybody can hear me because I can't see what's going on in the um, chat site since my screen is doing the sharing. So for Iowa State, we are also housed in the grad college, but we are divided under the Center for Communication Excellence. Um, we split that separate from the graduate services and faculty services. Now where they come in is they deal with the paperwork, like the exams, the final oral exams, things like that. But when it comes to thesis and dissertation format reviews, that's under our center, right? So I'm the program coordinator and I uh, supervise the consultants and reviewers. And by consultants, they are student uh, consultants. They are grad students who have been trained to understand what format reviews uh, entail, what the guidelines are, they don't do the reviews, right? The reviewers do the reviews, but they do the pre-format review. So they are the first line of defense for students. Um, they are also the uh, defense, the, the support system when they get reviews back from, uh, comments back from the reviewers and they don't know how to fix it. So they can get support that way. So there was a question that came and I'll address that now. The grad student consultants do not do the reviews. They assist students in getting the reviews correct. Um, so currently I have one reviewer. So my, if you look at the ETD size, I'm right in the middle of all the five panelists. We're about 660 files. Again, fall is lower, spring is heavy, summer is also heavy. Um, with one, one full-time reviewer, it gets pretty tricky during crunch time, right? So we do have a backup reviewer. And um, in the engagement uh, community, I was talking about how it's dangerous to have one reviewer. If your one reviewer is out, then no review, no review gets done, right? So we looked into having a backup reviewer. And this backup reviewer comes in um, during the last month of the cycle. And she assists with all the heavy traffic, you know, um, and we split up the files. So that helps us through crunch time. Um, other, oops. And other than that, um, I think it's pretty similar to the University of Utah. We deal with the monitoring of guidelines and so forth. We organize events, most of uh, that will come up later in the separate questions. But this is uh, essentially what we do. And the collaborators are it's pretty much the same. We added a few like the legal counsel and the um, Office of uh, Technology and Transfer. So I'm gonna move on now to Sally. Hi, so I'm at George Mason University and my office is a, I'm a one person office, which I'll talk more about and I know will come up in questions in the future. Um, I do work with the registrar's office and the provost's office in different ways. Um, and that's in the material that Larry uh, shared with everybody and it's going to be in the book but um, Mason has about in a calendar year we we average about 475 uh, theses and dissertations that come through my office um, my office is under university libraries we do not have a graduate school uh, we're a decentralized school so we have many graduate programs um, we you know have almost 500 theses and dissertations per year but we do not have a governing body known as the graduate school we have a graduate council that makes decisions and we have the provost office which is in charge of the education side and the registrar's office which is in charge of the administrative paperwork side and then i'm sort of i'm not i'm officially under university libraries but my job consists of very little library work. Um, it makes sense for how I ended up there if you go, if you look at the history. But anyway, for now, what I do, I'm the person who uh, checks format reviews, uh, who does format reviews. Um, I also, in leading up to format reviews, I manage our website, I update our guidelines, I um, house our book to our two templates, LaTeX and Word. Um, we created the Word template. Oh, probably about 11 years ago in conjunction with a department that no longer exists, the Department of, uh, the, I'm sorry, the Division of Instructional Technology. They helped us create a template that has you know, various features to make things easier for our students, but they're gone now. So I have to manage that and help students who need help with it. So, um, and in, in, in an effort to make things easier for them, I teach uh, biweekly uh, bi-weekly sessions on process, in, a, in other words, the process students have to complete in order to graduate, so process and Word, the Word template. 
Um, then once they're ready for format review, they send me their documents for format review. I review them. Uh, generally, it takes two rounds of review per student. Um, it may only take one, it may take three or more, um, but two is pretty normal. Then after that, um, I'm the person who receives all of their paperwork. So their final submission paperwork and the final copy of the document. So they turn in the final copy of the document and all of their I'm graduating paperwork to me. I process it and then after all that's done, then I'm the person who uh, does the ProQuest administrator processing. We only do dissertations there. And I upload by hand man or manually the uh, theses into our institutional repository, Mars. So I'm under, like I said, I'm under university libraries, but only that one section of ProQuest and uh, ProQuest and Mars is actually library specific. The rest of it, I kind of function as a one person graduate school in some ways. Thank you, Sally. And so you Thank see you. We're, we're shifting in terms of file sizes, but we're also changing in terms of how many staff members there are. Um, I will pass it now to Larry. Got it, we'll see. <clears throat> uh, we're basically a two person show, uh, the review manager and myself. Uh, the review manager handles uh, most of our uh, formatting and review issues through Microsoft Word, uh, except that I, she also, or my review manager also does reviews for Overleaf as well for the formatting issues. For any technical issues, I deal with those technical issues in Overleaf. Um, typically, uh, reviews will take up to about roughly 10 hours on an average. It'll take about 10 hours. Uh, some time ago, we actually determined and we added a little bit to it that we needed for each ETD, we needed about roughly 12 hours of review time. Okay. Now that seems kind of excessive, I'm sure, to the people that are dealing with hundreds or thousands of ETDs. Um, maybe not, because I know that I understand by listening to the other folks here on the, on the, on the uh, panel that there's a lot of people behind them doing things. Like, for example, Lily has people that do a lot of review stuff and work with the students. Well, that's not what we do. We work with the students ourselves. Um, and that's just the way we do it. We don't have that many ETDs, so we can definitely do that. But we do give a fair amount of time for all of the ETDs. And if you look in our, our uh, repository, I think you'll see what the difference is. Uh, it really makes a difference in the, the final product that we produce. And um, <clears throat> as I said, uh, Shirley deals with the bulk of the re reviews up front, front, and then she passes them to me. Once she thinks they're okay, then she sends them to me and I do a final review. And usually about 15, 20, 30 percent of the time, I will pick up on something. But as everybody knows, there's really no such thing as a perfect review. Um, because you can write a document and put it on the shelf and pull it off a week later, and you'll find all kinds of problems. And that's just the way this business works. But it's, it's a big help because I, don't, I try not to look at the document until right at the end of the process. And I do the final review. And I write the email that goes out to whom it may concern all of our, the registrar's office and all of our deans in the graduate school and review manager. And that tells our dean that, okay, ready to graduate. They've, they've, uh, all the exam information and all of that the way other institutions do it as well uh, which is great I'm glad we don't have to deal with any of that so that takes it off of us the only thing that we do that's a little bit different I think is when it comes to the approval the committee and the advisor approval of an ETD uh, we take that through our office because we generate the forms that go out to those individuals that they do a digital approval online through these forms. Okay, we get that information back. 
uh, we take a so-called a PDF snapshot of all of that information and that's that is then posted in the file in the student file in our office to show that they have been approved for graduation and their ETD is, is approved because the way we do things is until we get that approval from the faculty and the advisor we do not do an official formal review we'll do a pre-review okay we'll look at formatting issues in a pre-review that can be prior to the defense and that tells the student whether or not what they're doing so far is okay if it's not they see that as well and they get a complete list of information relative to discrepancies in their ETD so we tell them not to redo review. they don't need to do that but what they need to do is take that into consideration when they're working with the rest of their ETD so that they haven't generated 50 images that all have to, or figures that have to be adjusted or tables that have to be adjusted. Uh, it saves them a lot of time if they do that. Does do every, every student doesn't do that, by the way. Some students will, all of a sudden here they are and they dump this stuff on us and they have that review. Uh, they've had nothing. We find out usually that those students haven't uh, taken the training that we provide. Uh, we provide kind of a unique system of training in that they work with an actual template that we have interjected problems into it. We have put the typical 90% of the discrepancies we see, we put into that document. And then they have to go into that document and find those issues and correct them. We give them some, we have an uh, instruction manual that goes with that uh, exercise template. And so they follow that because it kind of, it's kind of a guideline as to how to go through the document. And we find that students that do well with that process have essentially no problems with their ETD. It takes care of all those issues. And so that's been a really big help for us. We have that document both in LaTeX and in Word. Uh, we have the same type of system set up in both of those that they have to go through and find the problems. So that's the way we kind of deal with our formatting issues is we try to cut them off up front before they become big. And the only problem we have is a few students sometimes that try to wait to the last minute and they'll come in and it's usually really tough. It's tough on my review manager. It's tough on the student. And usually it doesn't get to me to be real tough, but it can a few times it does. So that's kind of the way we deal with, with that. Okay, I'm gonna turn it back on. All right, can you mute? No. All right, All right. I'm gonna change up a little bit of the questions because um, I'm trying to watch for time and we have so much to go through. So um, setting aside the questions, uh, the, the question about templates, right? Can the panel talk to the kind of support system you provide for your students? Um, besides the template, what is one unique way that you provide at your institution um, the support for your students. And so here I'm just going to go with um, Erica, would you like to share? And I think I put you back on my laptop. All right, go ahead, Erica. Okay, so I think um, one of the things that we do that works really well is that we also do the preliminary reviews like Larry. Anyone does those, any, any editor can do those. But once someone submits for a full review, it's selected by one editor and that editor continues to work with them throughout the entire time. We do not have it to where they just go back into the, the pile for the next go round. So the same editor always deals with that student until we give them approval. Um, and we have a lot of requirements and a lot of things that we look for, even though we reduce some things, we've added some more. Um, so that's fun. Uh, we're just adding accessibility requirements, but we have a lot of things that we're looking for. And so sometimes it's not uncommon for us to go through the same manuscript 
nine times. Um, so it's a, it's a lot of work with one student. And I think having one person work with that one student continually is helpful. Um, especially like we email back and forth with our students too. So I can be like, you still didn't do this right. Let's talk about how to fix that. And I think that's really helpful dealing one student at a time. Great, thank you. And while I have the online speakers, I'm gonna pass it to Sally. Sally, would you share one thing that works well to support your students? So um, let me know if you can't hear me. So I, I don't know that I do anything terribly unique, but I just try to make sure that my students, that my, not my, our students, understand that I'm there to help them and I'm not there to make things harder for them. And that's, I, I really do feel like I'm the boogeyman that they, that the graduate students sit around their campfire and talk about, that, that eventually they're gonna have to go see the dissertation lady. So I try to make sure that they understand that I'm there to help, that um, they can email me anytime, that I, I, I have in addition to the workshops I provide, I also have um, office hours, now they're virtual because I'm fully virtual, but I have office hours and I try to stagger them throughout the day and week. So they can meet with me as early as 9 a.m. They can meet with me as late as 8 p.m. Uh, because I only work with graduate students. Um, so I just try to make sure that they are clear that I'm there to help, that I'm not there to make things worse. So they can email me anytime. I mean, even I was on vacation in August and I was checking my email and doing like, wasn't doing format reviews at that time because it was final submission week. So, but I was still working at that time. And I tell students, don't be afraid. Call me if you need, call me if you need me, email me if you need me, make an appointment with me if you need me. Don't ever, ever feel like they, don't ever feel like they are bothering me by making me, by asking me to do my job. If making me do my job is bothering me, then I shouldn't do it. So that's, and I, I, end up meeting all of the students in one way or another who are writing theses and dissertations. And I, you know, I try to forge like administrator or student relationships with them and to make sure that they know I'm accessible. So that's the big thing I try to do. And I guess that's the advantage of a one person show. So you don't need to guess who to go to. There's only one person to go to. Um, yeah. So yeah. People with one People often say, should I send my email to your to your like S7's address or to the um, office address? I was like, it doesn't matter because I, I'm the only person who reads both of them, as far as I know. <laughs> yep. um, Stacy, what do you do at the University of Florida? Find what we call a caseworker to the student make their mentor and then that case remains on place we for some of the things that the team would normally look for um, but in our case the team Called the milestone in place. So, for example, if they defended more than six, it's an That's an issue, and that's something we need to work on early in the process and get you know So, um, students really be as they see them as. dissertation. Um, I know that we have the best that it does help with the tech, but they don't meet with students there. Um, although so at any time. Uh, and so things a little bit uh, unusual and we did as well because, as everybody knows, the state of Florida was very much open during the pandemic. So, um, Great. 
great. And I want to say, you know, a lot of the institutions, you have all these resources, you just have a variation, right? So I'm just going to pick and choose a few. Um, and I would say, what I would say that stands out is obviously our grad students, we host all these boot camps and pre-checks, um, all with the assistance of our trained grad students. Um, there, there was a question of how long our boot camps are, they're about 90 minutes. Um, so they help us uh, before the submission time. And then I'll pass it to Larry to talk about his mixer because um, that's also another variation of support that a lot of institutions provide. It's just called differently um, at your institutions. At mine is info sessions. At Larry's is called a mixer and so I'll pass it to him. Okay, hopefully I'm online now. Um, <clears throat> we have we have a mixer uh, twice a year. We have a mixer in February and a mixer in September. And what the what happens prior to the mixer is that we provide instructional information with videos, and we update those videos every time that we really need to update those, and um, we pass those out to the students about two weeks prior to a mixer. And like we did with this program in terms of this panel, in terms of the fact that we per passed out information uh, prior to this meeting, actually, and asked for questions, we do the same thing with our students. We pass the information out to them, and then we tell them the mixer is going to be a Q&A. It's going to be questions and answer session. And so we spend about two hours answering questions. And the students base their questions on the material that they've read prior to coming in. Well, just like any class, you have a book and you're supposed to read the chapters before you go to class. It's the same type of process, but it's different in that it's virtual. And we pass, pass this information to them. And rather than having them come in and listen to one lecture, they've got our lecture, so to speak, right there in video and they can listen to them many times if they want to. And especially if they're either going with Word or if they're gonna go, uh, I produce many of the LaTeX videos and then Shirley produces so many of the, the uh, process and the, and the Word videos that go out with it. So depending on the, on the path that they take and a student does have a choice to take a path, then one of them will focus maybe on the overleaf information and LaTeX information, another student will focus on the word information. So we're kept busy for the two hour period that we meet with them twice a year. And what we've done in the past is we've had, we've kind of done this in two different ways. Uh, we've done it through Blackboard. And then most recently we've moved everything we've done into Blackboard over to Microsoft Teams. And the reason we've done that is because once you start a Microsoft team, all of the information related to that team stays in the team. It's right there. All the conversations are contained right in that team. There's no emails going back and forth whatsoever. Uh, everything is there. And the students know how to use it, I can assure you. They do very well with it. And we normally get, uh, oh, anywhere between 30 to 50 questions from students before they actually uh, come into a mixer. Some of those students, for whatever reason, they don't re provide us with a question prior to the mixer. But they'll ask the questions once they get it. And then when they hear that, you know, when we're at, what we do first when we start a mixer is we answer all of the questions that we have already seen, that we have received before the mixer started. So we take care of those right up front. And then everything is opened up for students at lib to to answer, to ask questions. And that kind of, you know, it kind of spurs other students to ask questions because then they start hearing the answers to what's already been provided and and they realize, oh, I need to ask this question. So then we get that. So we're pretty, pretty busy for two hours answering questions. And the students, we send out a survey form at the end and said, students seem to really like that process. It seems to work well. This last time, we didn't get as many questions before as I would like to have had. Uh, but the time before that, we had more questions than we had. So I think 
as far as the conference is concerned and how we set up the panel this time, I think that the, the structure was fine as the way we set it up, but we didn't get our information out to everybody as soon as we should have. We should have got it out about two weeks before we did. And I think we would have been, we had a lot more questions. We had some questions coming in. As you, coming in we have plenty. Of <laughs> uh, it keeps uh, us busy keep for this period of time. All right, so I'll, right, I'll move so on to I'll the question. Uh, the next question is about templates. So obviously templates is one of the easiest way to make sure that students get the support. You try to build in some of these guidelines ahead of time. So first of all, first of all um, before we go into the questions about templates, obviously a lot of them are in Word, some of them in LaTeX. Um, there was a question uh, about templates, like what is a manuscript style dissertation or thesis. So that's a question that was specifically targeted to Sally, even though some of our institutions do do it. I'm going to have Sally um, share with us what that is and how you deal with that. Sure. Um, so for anyone who doesn't know, you're probably all aware of it just in case. Now, for anyone who doesn't know, um, we, call it, we call it a manuscript style thesis or dissertation. And as opposed to the traditional chapter style thesis or dissertation in which the body is broken up into, you know, chapter one or a literature review, conclusion, whatever. Instead, it's you, it's generally three separate manuscripts that I, for the ease of talking to students about them, that I just call chapters. I understand their manuscripts. I understand it's not part of a great book. I just, it's, I, it's easier to call them chapters for me, just for the purposes of reviewing. Uh, so it's three individual manuscripts. Um, they are either, students have either uh, already submitted them and had them published by journals, they're in peer review, or they're going to submit them. But so they're held within the body of the document. And sometimes, you know, we allow students and their committees to decide what, whether to do this or not. Um, some students just include the three manuscripts and that's it. Uh, others will have an introduction at the beginning, you know, something to the effect of, in the following manuscripts, I will talk about blah, blah, blah. And then a conclusion at the end saying, as you can see in these manuscript uh, scripts, I talked about blah, blah, blah. Um, but not all of them do it and that's fine. Um, everything else is the same. Um, all of our other rules are the same. So everything that's in the beginning of the traditional chapter style manuscript, uh, thesis or dissertation, you know, signature sheet, title page, table of contents, abstract, et cetera, et cetera. Um, everything at the end, abstract, references, biography, that all has to be there. Everything still has to be set up according to our guidelines. And that's sometimes when we run into issues with students who have questions about it. It still has to be set up according to our guidelines, but otherwise it's not really that much different. Um, we created a manuscript style template because a lot of students were asking for it. And I, I tried to, uh, explaining before that you can absolutely take our current template, the traditional template now, you can absolutely take that and make that a manuscript template. There's nothing about it that is inherently chapter based, but to, for ease of use and for clarity, we created a completely separate manuscript style document, even though it works works exactly the same way. And I'll skip this and I'll direct this question, this follow up question to Erica. So um, obviously we're talking about journal style manuscript, which means students may have already published the manuscript or preparing the chapters to be published. Um, what do you see as the advantage of having this kind of template? Or why the need for this template? Um, I think because, again, with my school being very hev heavily based in the hard sciences, um, it's becoming the norm to see these types of manuscripts come out, these, these, these dissertations that are already published materials, you know, they, they put in the ones that work in the lab, they put in all this effort to co-author these papers throughout the course of their um, PhD. So that's really the bulk of their work and asking them to write something separate is something that just doesn't happen anymore. So seeing this, um, the shift, is something that we need to better prepare for. Um, and I, we do not have a separate um, template for it. We do have instructions for people to 
adapt our template to say we we ask that they label it the chapter so they'll call it chapter one whatever the title of their paper is and they'll have the copyright information printed there and then on the next page they'll start with the content um, we currently allow for them to copy the content and put it matching our our format or we are currently also allowing them to insert actual pages from the journal um, and just put page our proper page numbers on it and make sure it fits in our margins. That's something that we're revisiting with our shift to accessibility because essentially those are pictures and not, not text. So it is not screen, uh, screen reader friendly. Um, we're trying to figure out some sort of compromise to where that can be adapted. Um, because that's a lot of extra work to take an article that's already formatted and then reformat it. Um, yeah. And that's something that a lot of students are not happy to do. <laughs> so um, allowing them to insert as is is something that's, that's very helpful for them right now. And it also avoids a lot of issues with the publications not wanting, some will allow adaptations. But some are like, no, you must reprint as it, which of course, you know, minor shifts and moving the the figure to the proper place and, and moving the margins around isn't a big deal. But they don't want any changes in the text. And we, one of our requirements is that if you type out the information, you have to refer to all the figures in proper order. And not all publications do that. So we're asking them to go back in and change things that the public, the publishers don't really want to be changed. So um, there's that balance of trying to figure out what works best for us versus what works best for the students. So we're trying to figure out a way to allow them to just insert the pages and maintain accessibility. What Thank we you. did in that case, the rule, the rule that we made, when I say we, I'm using the, the royal we I made uh, after asking some others. Um, the rule is if like if they have something that they cannot change, like you were talking about, if it's already been printed and the publisher says, no, it can never change from this format. Fine. You are absolutely welcome to you to include, say, your article uh, images of your article that are set in dual column, single space, pink font. That's fine. You can do that, but it has to be an appendix. So that's it, it, anything that you have in the body of the document has to be set up according to our guidelines. If you want to include that article, you are, you are welcome to, but it has to go in the appendix. So. Thank you. And I'm going to move now to talk a little bit more about templates. So I'm, I'm trying to be mindful of the time that we have. We have so much, like I said, to cover. So I have to be selective to just kind of choose stuff um, and then give you time to um, ask questions as well. So for the next question, we're going to talk about templates, right? Um, we talked about Microsoft templates before and, and how we can use that for variation between the traditional style and the manuscript style. But now I'd like to just kind of invite Lee to talk about Overleaf as a, a, a way to write, um, in, in, there's a software that allows people to write. Why is it advantage over Microsoft, for example? And then we'll go into how we support um, Overleaf templates as well. So Lee. Thank you. Um, my name's Lee. I'm on the support team at Overleaf. And so one of the things I do is I, I answer a lot of emails about uh, end users who need help with LaTeX. So if you're not familiar with Overleaf, um, it's a collaborative online LaTeX editor. So it's a lot like Google Docs, except it's for LaTeX. So one of the big benefits um, that can help students and ETD programs is that LaTeX works right in the browser. So you don't have the overhead of having to support a student installing LaTeX and then an editor and then how to get the editor to talk to LaTeX properly and all that stuff. So Overleaf works right in the browser. Um, and it has a lot of other features. Um, it allows you to collaborate with others. That's the big benefit, because if you try to collaborate on a LaTeX project that you're just compiling locally on your computer and you want to send it to someone else, you'd have to send them several files. And then it, it's easy to lose track of which files most up to date. It's just kind of hard. 
I mean, that would also be difficult if you were just emailing Word files back and forth as well. But Overleaf has a few features that other LaTeX editors don't have. Um, the collaborations, the big one, uh, but it also allows you to sync your projects to Dropbox and GitHub. It integrates with some reference manager softwares. Um, it has real-time track changes and you can make comments directly inside the editor. So that's just a few of the, the benefits of Overleaf. LaTeX itself is also really beneficial, um, especially for students in uh, science and mathematics disciplines because it's very challenging to type mathematics with uh, Microsoft Word. Um, it is really hard because you have to click several buttons and but LaTeX really facilitates that. But anyone anyone can use LaTeX um, in any discipline. Um, it'll make bibliographies automatically um, so you don't have to figure out like does the journal title get italicized or is it bold or whatever um, system you might need. But the LaTeX template itself will format it for you. So that's also the big one because it makes the margins for you and it usually looks really nice. So I think that's a short uh, little introduction, but if I miss something um, that someone wants to know, please ask me and I can talk about it. Thank you. And I'm gonna put Stacy in the spot because I know they have a uh, Overleaf template, but not a subscription. So talk about that and how challenging it is. What, what the challenges are when you have a template, but you don't have the necessary support for it. So Aura, let me know. I can't hear you, Stacey. Try again. Can you hear me now? Okay. So um, we currently, um, Overleaf does support us. They do host a template for the University of Florida, but we um, do not have the full support staff that um, like Lee was talking about. Um, our IT folks in the help desk actually are who support the LaTeX template. Um, that is somewhat difficult in the sense that they, those are help desk employees, they're often student employees. And so kind of learning the ins and out of LaTeX are pretty difficult. And then it seems like as soon as they've mastered that, then they've moved on to a new job. And so I, I highly recommend that folks, you know, really set up an account and work closely with Overleaf rather than trying to post um, your own LaTeX template and then, it, um, you know, have that made available. Um, we used to have someone that was in the um, help desk and they were extremely good at LaTeX. They, they really understood it, they had mastered it, um, and they worked closely on that template. Um, but then they retired and once they were gone, we found that even the folks that had worked under them for years did not understand all kinds of things um, about the bib files and the references and all of the things that Lee was pointing out are really well formulated on their end and with their support. So I, I highly recommend going straight to Overly. Thank you. And at Iowa State, we learned the hard way too. We have, uh, we had just the Overly template, nobody to support it. And the questions would come to us our reviewers didn't know how to fix it. We just saw the problem, right? Then they had to scramble and find um, ways to fix it, which is really frustrating for us and the students. So we managed to find funding. We found grad student consultants who were experts in LaTeX and knew our guidelines. And so sustaining that was our way of moving forward and getting support that we need. I'm going to shift now to Larry to talk about how he uses the Overleaf for the um, ETDA process. So in his office, they review all the files in Overleaf, is that right? Yeah. That's different from what we do. Even though we have the template, the students submit the final product in PDF. They did all the edits um, in Overleaf, but in Larry's case, he does the ETDA process in Overleaf. And so I'll let him talk a little bit about that. <clears throat> yes, yes, absolutely. absolutely. Uh, when you, you, you can, you can do, do what, what Lily does, does in their group, does, does relative to generating, generating the PDF, PDF file from 
uh, LaTeX itself, which is very easy, and then allowing the edits to take place within that PDF file. However, you're missing a lot of the power of LaTeX by doing that because it's very simple in LaTeX to leave comments directly on the self on the uh, code pane of Overleaf. And so I encourage, and this is the way we actually do it, is uh, students actually use those panes as well. They use them um, when they're first getting the document put in there and then decide, that, well, I need something here. I'm really note for myself, so I'll go back and put that information in. That's very helpful to the student. We've had We've a couple of faculty, faculty, faculty two or three faculty, three faculty now that have actually, actually used LaTeX. They'll make, they'll they'll make, they'll make they'll create account an account because they want to be in there. Uh, one is in the the former dean of the College of Nursing, uh, was in there with two of the students now, actually. And they'll leave comments to the students. So the students are writing their information. And we, we try, try, to, to, we, I try, I try to, to stay out, out of it when that's happening. And I tell just until the advisor is finished making comments to the students, just leave it alone. And that worked very well because then once they're finished, I ask them to go ahead, if they're finished with it, go ahead and erase your comments, resolve your comments, and then we start the review process. And then we add comments for the review. So we don't get mixed up with comments from the advisor and comments from the reviewer. Okay, so that kind of keeps, keeps that separated. separated. The few cases, cases we have, provided, we wish we could take thing in there, then that's, that's what we well. well. Um, otherwise, uh, we do all of our formatting reviews directly in, in overview. We do not generate a PDF file and then do the over. This, you're exchanging too many files. And that's the advantage of Overleaf is you start with one Overleaf project and you end with one Overleaf project. You don't pass any files back and forth to anybody. You share the file with the student rather than this, because the student doesn't have the power that we have. Um, the way we have our system set up, we only have 10 seats of overleaf. In other words, 10 people that I can allow to be users in the overleaf system. But that's more than enough. We don't even need that much. And the reason is because I can share an unlimited number of files with students. Okay. The limitation on that is that I can only share, share that, that one file with 10, 10 people. people. Well, we, we don't, don't have, have any research, research committees that are 10 people in size. And, and I'm not sharing with everybody in the, in the committee anyway. Right now, we just share with the advisor if the advisor would like to be in there at the same time. And that's great. Most of the time, we don't do that. We don't need to do that. Um, what my review manager does is she will make a summary email to go out to those people that are maybe a little technically challenged, and they see what's, they watch what's going on with the review all the time that the advisor does. Now, we have moved from Overleaf, well, not from Overleaf, from Blackboard with our with our Word documents, we were, we've were moved everything there into Teams. And the reason we've done that is because it does do a little bit about what Overleaf does in consolidating all the communications into one, one location. And we're not exchanging documents back and forth. And we don't have a problem with a student. Oh, that was the wrong document. I sent you the wrong document. That doesn't happen because we have the document. We control it. Now, when Microsoft gets their their web version of Word up to snuff, which it isn't yet, then we will be doing the same thing with Word documents. We will share a Word document with a student, and that will be the one document they use until they're finished. Okay? There will be no exchange documents. That's because it's too many emails, too much stuff going on. So it, in that respect, in terms of communication, in terms of they have a track, track edit function. They have a track edit function. And it works just as well as Microsoft or anything else that can change it. In fact, the color 
codes everything. I love it. Uh, everyone, say I've got five people working on an older life document, is all of us a different color. So you can see immediately by the highlighting and some changes that are made, exactly who made those changes. So, and if I'm trying to instruct a student and help a student so they can see exactly what I did and it works with everything I've done. Okay. And then they can go back in there and look at that information. Oh, oh yes, yeah, that's the way to do that. that. I don't have any more problems with it. Well, I can make several edits in different places and try right changes going on. All they do is look that I click and see where I've made changes, look exactly what I did, and they're off and running. No problem. Okay, I think we have 10 more minutes. And so I, I know we have a lot that we haven't covered, but I want to stop our presentation here and take questions from you. You've listened to us very patiently and I appreciate that. Uh, with all the technical issues, um, you know, we've lost some time, but please know that um, all the information that's coming through the ebook, it will continue to evolve. As you bring up questions that will help us think through, oh, this is not clear. We need to share this. And our goal is that we can pull together this knowledge base so that everyone here can also contribute your own chapters. And then we can see how things work across different institutions. So if you have a question in this room, please come up to the mic. For those of you who are online, please type your questions into the chat. And I believe, Terry, you will be monitoring those and bringing those up for us. Okay, so uh, please feel free to come up. You know, things that we didn't get to cover, we didn't get to cover uh, consent forms, we didn't get to cover a lot of paperwork, record keeping, time management, embargoes. All of these questions um, are important to how you handle the ETDAs. Um, as we mentioned before, it's not so much in getting the final product now, it's a matter of helping our students make it accessible to our student, uh, to the readers. That's the ultimate goal. So what is it that concerns our students as they are publishing their scholarly work now and also in their future careers? That's our, the role of our ETDA process now. Not just holding a margin uh, ruler to measure. <laughs> Not just pushing them out the door. Right. So any questions from the audience here? Uh, maybe a comment about how you do it at your institution, how it falls differently from our um, panel's experiences, something new uh, that we haven't heard of. Yay, we have somebody coming up to the mic. Thank you. Hello. Yay. Hello. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Tim Watson from the Ohio State University. I'm the director of graduation services in the graduate school. Um, a question, maybe mostly for Stacy, but any of the other panelists. So uh, you will probably hear this theme a lot about uh, our post COVID world. At Ohio State, we require our PhD students to do a form effort in person. They had to come into the office. Um, with COVID, of course, we had to adjust like everybody else into uh, bringing online reviews. Um, we are struggling with trying to find a platform in which to do that. Our uh, IT services, unfortunately, are uh, nothing against shared services, but um, we've got our own, own issues with that, no issue, and, uh, so we don't have anybody in graduate school to help us with this. So we're trying to find something. Uh, we tried, we looked into Vireo, uh, we ended up getting some issues with that. That guy can. Um, we are, are using Salesforce right now. Uh, it is not a format review system. Um, so I know Stacy, you Florida had developed our own system, so I'm curious to hear a little bit more about that. But and even the overleaf, I wasn't really quite sure whether that is maybe a, a platform or something like that. I keep saying to the staff, I said, I just want something that the students submit the document, we're notified. We return it, you know, give them their comments back, and, and that's it. If they want to have other comments, then we shift it to something else. But I just want that quick review system so we can just look at them and, and go for it. And I will say, too, I was a, in a long time, I was a staunch uh, person about doing these format reviews in person because I, I felt that interaction.
interaction with the student was important. You know, we've lost that over the year, right? The old timers can remember back when people were trying to schedule the courses and so forth that were lined up the door, right? We were way far away from that, right? And um, so we've lost a little bit of that, I think, as well. But I will say the benefit, of course, is that you can manage your time better. We did it on a walking basis, so we had to drop what we were doing. We were responsible for the evaluation list, so we had to drop what we were doing. And do these more memories. So I will say the online does help in terms of uh, you know managing our time better and getting back to students that have a little better too. But anyway, I'd just like to hear your thoughts on, on the uh, a format review system. Of course, we are sitting on final documents to Ohio Link. And I don't want to use Ohio Link because I don't want to confuse the students about what's in final version and what's their draft. So anyway, thank you very much. So like Tim mentioned, um, we've kind of been in this game for quite some time. So I have to admit, our first review system was built in Cold Fusion. If anybody's familiar with that, that was quite a long time ago. Um, we were also tracking stuff like paper forms at the time. Now we um, track all of our uh, submission forms are all electronic. Um, the, it is built in-house, so Tim, I'm happy to let you kind of talk to our developers um, and, you know, kind of the, they can give you more background information. Through the years, we've had to integrate um, systems that change around campus. So that is the one thing about having that um, when it's built in-house, uh, your review process. Um, as soon as the university changes their platform for, say, how the final exam forms will be submitted, then we had to basically rebuild our programming. Um, we ensure that a lot of forms and everything are in place before we do the review process. And so those are all built into our system as well. And then our final um, process, we transfer it to the UF libraries who then coordinate with ProQuest. So um, we don't do any kind of review process in there. One of the things that was really helpful to me, because um, I know Larry always asks a lot about managing the number of reviews that we do. And I'm like you, Tim, I miss them coming in my office. I, I mean, I, I will admit, I think we could go through a lot of them much faster that way. But like you said, we had to drop everything to handle it. Um, now, uh, since we do kind of everything virtual, um, they can still drop in. We just don't get as many visitors. But um, I built review templates for my reviewers. So anything that is in, say, the template for the students, so they need to know, oh, they're not formatting the tables correctly. My reviewers just type the word table, and it puts in all of the review comments for the table. And then they can just delete what doesn't apply. And so that actually was one of the most like time-saving things. It took me a while to build all the templates and all and to update it every time Chicago manual style changes something. But that has really helped out a lot. And it ensures that my editors are providing exactly the same information across the board. Um, and that worked out really well for us as well. I know we're tight on time. Thank you. That's definitely something that we're also exploring. We're trying to figure out if we can pilot an asynchronous format review because um, we have a lot of students that are distance ad students, and so they never step foot on campus, but we still wanna give them that support. Um, any other questions? We are running out of time. Terry, do you have any questions from the online board? Okay, any other questions from the room? Last five minutes. Yes, there's somebody else coming. So I'm Jeremy Johnson from Caltech, and I kind of wear the solo shop, but it's still on the library. Um, we get about 200 PhD theses a year, so it's not the overwhelming number. And by comparison to most of the speakers, we are a very loosey loosey shop when it comes to formatting. We do have guidelines as to just what they're following, and there's an order of the preliminary pages, but once they get beyond chapter one, we're not sitting there saying, oh, you didn't put this figure, you this figure there. There's no specific order that we need to do. So I'm just telling you, it doesn't have to be crazy. Maybe if you don't want to do such nice, you're going to let go. Um, the other thing that we do, we've been long time um, over the users. 
And we do have a large number of our grad students use Hemdraw to create the Hemdraw formulas. And those are the people that will not use LinkedIn. So it's like a whole campus full of high tech people. And I actually thought it wouldn't be the teenagers or social science students that don't use LinkedIn. No, it's the chemists. So, um, because but it's basically, Ken thought this would play nicely with my like, So they're the ones that use our word comments and actually openly created our word comments for us because we had very old ones at the time. Um, so there are situations where you have to do that. So going back to what I was saying about review and things like that, um, it, we don't think it's our responsibility to review the content of those. So when somebody submits it to us, they've already gotten past the event stage. They'll send us um, the PDF, and I will try to source that, whether it's a zip to my tech file or the actual Word doc. That's why I just want it, and I mostly want it because I don't want to have to recreate somehow the PDF if it gets um, corrupted, and then I have to basically either recreate the PDF from the um, original source file. So anyway, by the time it gets to us, all I'm doing is making sure the pages are all in there, in the actual documentation. And then it's, um, I will actually send something. We have a system back now where we're using the vast majority of the universe doesn't use. And we're getting ready to move to the So the way our system works is that the student actually deposits everything and creates a in the and a in the so it's kind of like what Texas does, but on a different platform. And then we respond to it, so we will, we will send everything back to their user work area with comments. I, and because I'm always worried about um, spam filters, I also send a separate email saying, hey, these are the changes we want to make. And sometimes we'll take a couple back and forth. So the fact that I don't have 200 average a year, I can do that when I like no touches. I don't have to worry about you know, basically being overwhelmed. So what I'm just saying is there are other ways around it, but it's absolutely going to. <laughs> yes, thank you. And yes, definitely um, one of the comments that I was going to bring up is that not every institution has guidelines. Some of the institutions that I've heard of, they, they are fine with once you have the title page, everything is up to you. It all boils down from the philosophy from our superiors, right? What's the re rationale behind it? I know at Iowa State, we have guidelines because our dean wants to make sure that all ETDs are professional looking, consistent, um, across all disciplines so that it's a branding thing, right? So if anybody picks up any ETD from our repository, they're going to look the same. From the template itself, if I look at the table of content, I can tell if it's a traditional or a journal style. I can tell right away. So that's the kind of hope we have in terms of having that rationale behind uh, specific guidelines, but it's not to say that you have to have guidelines. It all depends on your institution. If you have no guidelines, then I think it comes to what can we provide our students in terms of support so that their document becomes accessible to their readers. So one of the things that's coming up um, is accessibility, and you'll hear some of them talk uh, during this conference and beyond. So. Thank you again. Uh, I think this wraps up our plenary with a few minutes over. I appreciate your uh, patience with everything that went on. Um, and I look forward to more input. Um, I think Larry sent an email out. Feel free to reach out to him if you want to contribute to a chapter, more questions so that we can continue to make this uh, evolving living book useful for all of us. Yes, that's very important. Um, I think that the most important thing we can do is get feedback from the community. You're the community, the ETD community. And so we really need feedback as much as possible. And if you would like to participate and your university agrees that they would like to participate in the book chapter and what we've got started with a living book, uh, please do so. And uh, be sure and go in and read the uh, 
preference, preference that's in, in the information, information that we've already sent out. And, and just let us know you want a chapter. I will assign a chapter to you and you're off the go. Uh, we already have six chapters in, in process, process right now. Uh, we, we don't, don't have, have there, it's, it's more than, than just these panelists at this time. A Purdue University, University has also said they want to do a chapter. chapter. And, and also, also John, John, John Hagen, Hagen says he wants, wants to do a chapter as well. As well. So, so we're off and running. Thank you. Thank you.